All right, super. I'm going to get right into this because I know that we have a good panel coming up. So first of all, uh, thank you very much for having me here. I don't get to come out to the Hill Country very much. Um, got to stay with my brother over in New Braunfels last night, which is great, but um, never been to Bernie. So this is, this is a good uh, trip for me. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to try to, and there's some handouts there uh, if you want to hand those out. I have a little take home for you guys. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you a story about something that appeared to be magical that turned out to not be. <laughs> that doesn't make it any less compelling, I think. And, um, and I want, want you to know, that just like right from the beginning, that there are um, a lot of ways to get to where you'd like to be. This is not a game plan that will solve every problem. Uh, I just want you to know that. So let me just tell you, just real quickly, so I work for a, a land trust right outside of Houston, Texas. Um, very, very fast growing region uh, that's trying to save a remnant prairie just northwest of town. We've conserved about 20,000 acres since 1992, um, working with a variety of landowners, but we are still out very much in the country, and we'll talk about where that intersects with our work and how we plan to use that um, in different ways and how we address that. But here's one of the main points, and I've heard a lot of really great points uh, this morning that are right on target. Before you do anything, before you act, before you do any conservation work or anything, let me just tell you a couple, th it's like three things uh, that I find that people, not just master naturalists, but people make mistakes from the very beginning that doom them to failure. So avoid these mistakes. One is, and this, is, this happens all the time, is people have an idea of what they'd like to do. Say, save monarch butterflies. Ah, I'm gonna start a group. First thing I'm gonna do is go found a nonprofit, and then I'm gonna, yeah. Without checking everywhere in your region for who's doing that already. Because I can guarantee you, there, you are not the first person to come up with that idea. And I can also guarantee you that you're gonna be able to leverage a lot more of your skills if you're working with people who are passionate like you. So don't just start an idea and go running, because a lot of those efforts, frankly, end in complete failure and you're exhausted, got nothing done because you didn't work with the people who you could have worked with. Number two is, uh, how do you get there? So there's a football field, um, and I don't wanna to use too many sports analogies, but when you have the ball on the five yard line, there are many, many ways to get to the end zone. So don't think that there's some kind of a formulaic, prescripted, like this is the way to get to success. It comes in a lot of different varieties. So in terms of communications and advocacy, what I will tell you is environmental communications is very rich. There's a lot of ways to get to where you need. Some involve education, some involve marketing, some involve conservation psychology. There's lots of ways to, to get there. But here's the thing, not every way will work for every particular thing that you need to get done. And you need to recognize what really works well for certain things and what doesn't work well for certain things. And the last thing is, is once you become, um, you know, Ben was talking a lot about folks who didn't really know much when they got started. Um, and then they became experts or the experts in that area. So there is something called the curse of knowledge. And that is a very real thing. And what it means is, is that at one point you can become so knowledgeable about something that you totally lose track or touch of what common people know about that subject and you can overshoot them very, very badly. So that doesn't mean that you're a bad communicator, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. What it means is that you probably need to find someone to test your ideas with and to bounce ideas off of to make sure you're not overshooting your target or better yet, find a cadre of people who can be advocates with you with different knowledge levels so they can be more peer-to-peer. -peer. That's really important, okay? All right, let me tell you this uh, quick story. I'm gonna start at the end, and then we're gonna go to the, to the beginning. So um, in April or August of, um, of uh, 2013, so August, September of 2013, we held a press conference, we being a group of prairie advocates at a place called the Lothar Deer Park Prairie. It's about 50 acres. Um, and you're wondering, like, 50 acres? I mean, come on. You know, Katie Prairie Conservancy has conserved 20,000 acres. What's the big deal? 
Well, this turned out to be one of the most impressive botanical examples of a coastal prairie um, out there. And, um, and coastal prairie, just like prairie here in the hill country, is precious and just disappearing and, and hard to come by. So when we saw this, we thought, oh, we really need to save this. So the reason there was a press conference was because we needed $4 million to save this. This is in the middle of a city. $80,000 an acre. We typically pay in the countryside about $5,000 an acre. It was worth every penny, but here's the kicker. We raised it in five weeks. So it sounded like a miracle. And so the, the, the press conference was like all these newspaper reporters and everybody like, oh my God, how'd you guys do this? You, you just like you snapped your fingers and it just all came to being and you saved this wonderful place and isn't that a great idea when people put their minds to it? The reality was, as with all of these causes, is there is a chain of being <laughs> that goes way back with all of these things. And so I'm going to tell you about the backstory of this very successful effort. Um. So first thing is you needed to find this thing, and, and there's a gentleman up there named Don Verser who found it um, in 2011. And he was using Google Earth, which is a great way of looking at large areas of terrain to look for signatures of good habitat. Found this thing, we'd never, nobody even knew it was there. Nobody. And so we started taking groups out, we started measuring it. Jason Singerhurst from Texas Parks and Wildlife and other botanists came out and visited and were astonished by the diversity. And, um, and we also um, were working with three really wonderful uh, ladies in conservation. Um, the recently, uh, uh, well, Terry Hersher recently passed away, but she's kind of an icon in Texas conservation and, and Houston conservation. She is the icon. Jennifer Lorenz, who played a really outstanding role um, as the former head of uh, Bayou Lane Conservancy, my friend Flo Hanna here, who was a tireless advocate. So when we found this thing, we didn't know how we were going to save it. And the reason for that is that land had already been platted for new development. The developer told us, yes, I will sell it to you if you give me as much as I'll get for these houses. Can we get a discount? Yeah. <laughs> Give me the money, right? So let me just tell you a few things about how we got there. Um, but in terms of just talking to the general public, um, there's a couple of things. One is, and I love this quote here, and basically what this says is don't try to do too much. A lot of times what we do is we say, if people just know the facts, we heard this earlier today, they're gonna act, they're gonna do the right thing. That is not true. Just erase that, it's the hardest thing for master naturalists to erase from their memory, that if you yell a whole bunch of facts at somebody that they're just gonna like change their mind. Or that they're bad because they don't believe what you said, just like was said earlier. What you wanna do is you wanna inspire, and you can get there using a number of techniques, okay? If you can inspire people with a story you can get them to do a lot of things that are proactive, okay? So, one of the, the things about um, uh, this, this project of saving the prairie is we had to find out what that story was. We had to find out what was resonant. So, the first people to explore this place were botanists and naturalists and birders. And, uh, so, of course, those people thought the main story is that biodiversity, that's it. It's got this many plants, and we would list them. It has you know, over 300 plant pieces of plants. It has these many migratory birds. It supports this many mon monarchs, maybe. Da -da -da -da. And that's a typical way of looking at conservation, like I'm gonna give you the, the inputs into your brain are gonna be the numbers. The output is you're gonna wanna save this. Sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. There's no one size fits all. So we had to find out what that storyline was, and we tried that whole statistics, what I call naked statistics, not bounded by anything, technique, and it just failed miserably, miserably. Because you gotta remember that in the general public, and I don't know what the actual number for this is, the people who care about biodiversity conservation and are willing to put money behind that, it's pretty short. You're gonna hit a ceiling pretty quickly. Okay? So you're gonna have to find something else to move other people. So um, <clears throat> here's the reason 
why we wanted to save this. So this was all that was left of a prairie that extended, well, all throughout most of Houston, if you look at the 1944 map. Um, and, um, and so what we had to think about was, well, how can we get to a better place in terms of advocating for the saving of this thing? How do we get to a better place? And I'll tell you that it was an iterative process. It was a trial and error. Let's throw stuff at the wall. Let's see what sticks. So here's one thing that did stick, and, and one thing it proved to be really important. We produced a lot of video content. Not a lot in terms of like volume, but clips, enough clips to make it real. And here's what, this is where video content comes into play. So I work a lot with video, but I can tell you, I just put on a, a help coordinate a, a video series in Houston on wildlife films that are local. Very few local conservation groups spend money on video content. I think that's really, really a bad decision. Because videos now can be shot relatively inexpensively with a private a videographer for like three to $5,000. And here's what we know about the videos and how they perform for us. 97% of the people who donated to this cause to save this prairie never once stepped foot on it. The vast majority of them, when we went back and asked them, why did you send money to us? They said, I saw the videos online. Without video content, it's not quite as real, right? So we ended up getting donations from four, four foreign countries, 22 states, and all across Texas. And part of it is just that recognition that we are a very virtual society now. So if you can't get your message out through social media, let's say that, how many of you guys, seriously, raise your hand, like, you don't know anything about social media and you don't want to know. Be honest, be honest. <laughs> That's okay, yeah, right. But, but, and I hear this all the time from conservationists across the state. They go, I don't know anything about social media. Eh, I'm not gonna deal with that. You've chosen to lose at that point. Don't even try. What you need to say is, I don't know anything about social media. Who would know? My grandkids, younger people in an organization, or hip older people who know about social media. So don't, don't, um, don't short circuit the system before you get started. Like I said, we had to convey a powerful message. Here's the message that worked for us. There are two things that actually ended up working. And the way that we tested this is by using reporters. So we had reporters who would come out and do stories. And we would, we would literally, as we were doing the stories, we would test out language. Oh, I'm gonna tell them this angle. I'm gonna tell them that angle. And I would see how they would respond. So good case in point. I was getting nowhere with the biodiversity thing with a, t a very famous TV reporter. And he's like, oh, this game. And I said, I said, you know, I'll tell you what. One of the things that's cool about this is that it's one of the most ancient pieces of earth in Houston. And he goes, what did you just say? And I said, you heard me. This prairie might have been here for thousands of years. See, nobody thinks anything is old in Houston. We're a historyless place, right? Mm -hmm. So that was enough of a mental strain for him. So he said, hey, can I lead with that when we go live? I said, oh, if you want to. I mean, that'll be great. I mean, you know, whatever. Thinking, yes. I learned out. I learned what he was talking about. I had a word that resonated. So a lot of times what we're doing is we're calling these old growth prairies now. Because that's exactly what they are. They're like a redwood forest, but nobody thinks of them in that way, okay? Because they're not, you know, 10 bajillion feet tall. Another thing that really worked for us in terms of conveying this message was time pressure. So a lot of times when conservation groups go out and they say, we want to buy this piece of land, there's no, there's no time limit to it. There's no urgency. There's no set of like, we need to get this or it's this. We were telling people, if we don't get this piece of property, it's going to be that in a month. And we're going to be brutally honest with you. When they develop a piece of property like this, it's not what you think. Animals don't go magically somewhere else and live somewhere else. All the animals are dead for the most part. Okay? Don't fool yourself into thinking that these guys are going to magically move somewhere else. Every place in nature is full. 
So we made the gopher kind of the symbol. They're gophers depending on you. I had a lady like the night before, she said, I cannot sleep. Are you going to save those gophers? <laughs> and I said, I said, we're going to try. We're going to try. So a sense of urgency or a deep sense of meaning is, is are two potential pathways. Another thing is, you know, social media. If you're going to do social media and you really care about it, pay for it. Don't just use organic, like uh, person to person, that's good. But look at the spikes we got when we actually paid for social media, bam. So we were hitting like maybe like 200 views. We would get, you know, and this isn't showing actually the highest peak. We, we went up to like 50,000 views on one we paid. It wasn't a lot of money, but it made a huge difference because it got into people's networks across the world, okay? I've already talked about naked statistics, so I'm going to go ahead and skip this in, in terms of, of uh, but what I'm saying is, don't try to kill people with statistics. It's oftentimes not going to, statistics should be used very judiciously to tell a deeper story, a deeper meaning. Yeah, like I, you know, I, I, I tell this to some folks in, in my agency all the time, it's like, it's like, so what? 300 of what? Uh, you know, eight of what? Who cares? There's no story behind those statistics. Um, so what we did is we told stories of animals that depended on this place to live. This meadow lark means this place to nest. We just saw this animal today. We put it up on social media. This is an animal that will go away. If we don't save this. Okay. And I'm not going to play the audio for this, but here's, here's uh, something uh, ridiculous that we did. And I got called like maybe at 3 o'clock one afternoon and said, hey, Jaime, go get your suit. What we did is we, and Stephen Colbert had his show on, um, on um, Comedy Central at the time. And if you, went on his, if you went on his show, you got what's called the Colbert bump if you're a politician. You're bumping ratings. So we took a, a pimple mound, which is a sand hill, and we renamed it the Colbert bump. So here's what we tried to do. We tried to get on his show, but we knew that we probably weren't. It didn't matter. It didn't matter because people started asking themselves the question, can Stephen Colbert save the Deer Park Prairie? And it went across the planet. Okay? It was in media outlets in Romania and in England and in everywhere because the power of celebrity, right? Now, we don't know if he actually donated anything, but like I said, yes, here you go. It's just all over the place. Like I said, uh, Jennifer Lorenz was a real instrumental person in getting all the funding here um, for this project, and she has a communications degree and is very skilled, and there's Andy Sirota, the guy that I was talking about earlier. And she and I would have meetings at midnight some nights. What worked today? You talked to this radio station, I talked to this TV station. What worked and what was a total bust? Let's get that out of here. Let's not use that anymore in our, in our talking points. And like I said, we developed a vocabulary, some of which I put into your, into your uh, thing there. But we have also worked on cultivating champions. This is Lisa Gray from the Houston Chronicle. And once you have a champion in a no lo local newspaper or TV outlet, they are golden because they will keep your issue alive because they're vested in it and they get really going. All right. Am I, when am I finishing up, just so I know? What's on the schedule? 11.15. 11.15? Okay. 11.50, all right, let me speed up a little bit. So it looked like magic that we raised this $4 million. And I gotta tell you that one of the pictures I show you, Terry Hershey, made an uh, institutional gift of like half of that. So that was a huge thing, right? But when we took Terry Hershey out there to see it, to see if she wanted to donate, it there was the most a tremendous rain and windstorm you'd ever seen. And so we're literally driving across part of this prairie, and we're about to kill an icon from this rain, wind and rainstorm. So she didn't really get to see the prairie. I was totally soaked. We went back and had dinner, and so I had an iPad. That's how she saw the prairie, and I showed her a video. And that was good enough for her. 
That was good enough for her. So what I'm saying is, you, you, if you cultivate some, some, some good imagery, it can go a long way. So the truth of the matter is, is that nothing like this happens by happenstance. There's no magic in this. It's all based on people and people connections. So the story actually starts in, in 2008. There was this gorgeous piece of coastal prairie. It's like an intact coral reef in the middle of a neighborhood in West Houston. Well, we got the word that they wanted $10 million, and they wanted it in a month. We said, well, we don't really have $10, $10 million. Um, uh, what can we do? So we dug up a whole bunch of plant material out of here, about 25,000 square feet, put it in 33 different pocket prairies across the city, some in, inside the city. But in the end, it turned into that. Horrible, horrible. But from, from loss comes something good. So we decided that the reason we couldn't raise that $10 million was not that none of us were rich. That wasn't the reason. The reason is, is that we weren't connected. We could not mobilize an army to save this place because we hadn't done the work before this happened to get everybody on the same page and redirected so that we could fight as an army. So that's exactly what we did. Right after this, we formed what's called the Coastal Prairie Partnership. And the goal of the partnership is pretty simple. Unify the army and have them work with us on big goals so that we can all be on the same page. So there are some certain, certain things that we did. One is in terms of building the army, we made a distinction very early on that you guys and people like me who get paid are on the same army. There, there aren't generals and colonels and majors, okay? Anybody who's gonna be in your army should be treated with respect and should be treated equally in terms of being stakeholders. We wanted to erase that line as much as possible. So in the awards that we give, in the recognition, in, in sometimes in areas of responsibility, some of our master naturalists are amazing leaders, way better than the people who get paid to do their job. And so you go, just like a football team, you don't think about their pedigree. Think about what they can do on the field, right? So we definitely do that. And we give them stuff to do, right? Because the thing is, here's the thing. Your army is going to proceed into a different state, which is they're going to be a cluster of friends if you do this right. But friendships require regular meeting. So throughout the year, we plan all kinds of prairie plantings, seed packing parties, awards dinners, uh, workshops, all this stuff, because people want to be fed. They want to be, they want to know more, but they want to do things, and you just got to keep them motivated. Because the thing you can't do is from a cold stop, ask a whole bunch of strangers to do something for you. You cannot do that. It does not work. That's why when you used, to, for you guys who are retired or for you guys who are still working, when you go to a business meeting and you don't know anybody in the room and somebody has a big ass, nobody does it. Because people fight for their friends way more than they fight for strangers, okay? Friendships, critical. Create a rapid action team. This is what we did. So what we did is we picked the prairie chickens this is not the best picture, but we call them the prairie chickens. And these are all volunteers. But we said, your job is if we need people to do something today, not tomorrow, not next week, because we're running on a real tight timeline, we need you to get this information out through this channel within two hours of us calling you. Just like a political action rapid response team. Okay? But what it did is it made sure that we were in way more newspaper articles and TV and, and we could mobilize people in big groups to come out. Make it really rapid. Teach your army, right? You guys are master naturals. I mean, part of why you're here, just be honest, is you like learning. That's okay, that's good. So provide opportunities for whatever cause you, you are, are doing for your folks to learn. And don't do it by yourself. Don't drive yourself into the ground. When we do the Southern Plains and Prairies Conference, we do it with the Native Prairies Association of Texas, with uh, a just a number of groups, and we say, let's jigsaw this puppy out. We all have this common need. You know, I always say, uh, different logos, same team. 
And that's exactly the way that you need to see it. You know, so when I get a little bit of pushback about collaboration, um, you know, I, I ask the reverse question. Do you have a really good way of adding 50 people to our staff today? Can you afford that? Because if you can, I won't collaborate with all these people. Otherwise, I'm going to keep collaborating with these people because this is my army over here, right? So um, here's something that really needs to be done more of in terms of advocacy. Honor the people who are doing the work. A lot of these people never <clears throat> receive praise within their own agency, recognition, any of that stuff. This is Jed Aplaca. He works for the city of Houston. He's putting in pocket praise all over the city. Awesome, we're working with him. Do you think he's got a bunch of awards inside the city or from anybody else? No. No, he doesn't. This is meant like, like promotions for people, more research dollars for people. So you gotta, uh, so every, every uh, uh, December nowadays what we do is we, um, we have something called Prairie Stampede, which is basically an opportunity to get the entire Prairie community of Southeast Texas together spotlight what everybody has done regardless of what group they're in give out awards and say look this is one army let's work together but we also do we go further than that we say well i say you know your my success is based partially at least partially on your success if you are weak i am weakened you're making me weak if you are strong, it makes my job a lot better. So if a nature center down the road does a really great job with the Prairie Festival and, and energizes people, that's like air support for me. It makes my job so much easier. So when you silo up and you say, I'm just gonna work like a dog to get that done by myself and I can do it by myself, you are just short-circuiting that whole system of interconnectivity because frankly, all of these nonprofits, the, the State Parks Department, the federal government, it's one big ecosystem of groups, and they have pushes and pulls on one another. And if you silo up, you are missing out on the energy of that system, okay? So that's, that's what we recognize, is that we cannot operate in silos and be ultimately successful. So we've been able to do stuff like this. We're running Prairies and Pollinators Month right now with all these different groups. We ran a big film festival earlier in the year. And now the conservation community in Houston, not just through our efforts, but through other efforts, when we say, hey, let's all get together for a meeting and let's talk about this one thing, it used to be like pulling teeth. Now it's like that's totally normal. That is completely and totally normal. Why wouldn't we do that together? Why not share the costs? Okay? Daylighting your cause. And all of these things, by the way, we're talking about that Deer Park Prairie. All of these things were necessary to prepare the soil to get to that point where when five weeks was left and we needed $4 million, we put out the call, who can help us with this? These people had been through workshops. They'd gotten awards. They'd become friends. They'd done all these different things. And so they were like, of course I'll do it. Of course I'll do it. You're asking me to do it. Therefore, I will do it. So one thing that uh, Ben was talking about, and I think this is really critical in our time and, and age, is to daylight your cause. It'd be very easy for the Katy Prairie Conservancy to sit on the Katy Prairie, which is about 45 miles out of Houston, on our big preserve, and say, we're just going to wait for people to come to us. But that's not what we do. What we do is we help partners build pocket prairies in the most heavily trafficked areas we can find in the middle of Houston. If somebody says, I want to build a pocket prairie, and I want to put it on the back 40 so that it, it's, it might be ugly and I don't want people, we said, we're not interested. We want to build a pocket prairie in the heart of the Texas Medical Center, the biggest medical center in the world. How big do you want it, and how can we get there? So we have a two-acre prairie that we've worked with MD Anderson Cancer Center. We work at schools, now churches. Um, about five universities are going to have pocket prairies come fall. This thing is exploding because we don't want to be hidden. We want to be in your face. The first place that we picked was Herman Park. There are about nearly 3 million visitors to Herman Park. So we said, well, where are we going to put our first pocket prairie? We said, pick the place where the most people are. That's where you need to put it, and that's where we put it. By the way, this right here, 
This is in the medical center. This is the MD Anderson Prairie. Now we're finding all kinds of amazing things biologically in here, but that's not the reason we did it. We did it for public engagement and a stress release for all the caregivers there. So, you know, booths and things like that. But here's, here's one of the take home points that I wrap up. So if you want a cause to be successful, start now. Don't wait until you're in emergency mode because that Psalms Prairie tells you exactly what happens when you get in emergency mode and you don't have your ducks in a row, you don't have your friends lined up, you're gonna fail. So if you're really interested in doing it, start right now. Figure out who's doing it, who you can work with, how you can complement each other. Because what happens sometimes is not some things that we would predict, but come about. This is my home city, uh, last, you know, in August, in late August, early September. The mess, it's a disaster, a trauma, it was awful. You can see that the, the weather forecasters actually had to put different, they had to make up colors because they didn't have a color to signify that amount of rainfall. And 50 inches is there. Nederland got 64 inches. 64 inches. Catastrophic. But here's the, here's the point. The point is because we've been working, we had a goal of daylighting prairies and their importance culturally, uh, you know, biologically, in all these different ways. This editorial just came out a couple of weeks ago. Seven things that the special session of, of uh, the legislature needs to to think about and the, and the, and the, and the, um, the, the decision makers in Houston. This never, ever, ever in a million billion years would have ever appeared on any list in 2008. I'll just be dead honest with you. Would have never appeared. It's that steady drumbeat, steady drumbeat, steady drumbeat that goes into an orchestra immediately. And it looks like magic like Deer Park Curry, but it's not. It's all ground game. Uh, I'm gonna skip that. All right, so I'll, I'll save the questions for the, for the panel since I'm, I'm, my time is done. But like I said, main take home point is find out who can do what on your team. Don't feel like you need to do everything and work with others to get, get you where you need to go and start way before you actually get into crisis mode. That, those are my main three points. Thank you very much.